Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update, third part thereof for the 20th of March 2024. I'm fresh back from the neurologist. I'll tell you the news at the end of the video. In the meantime, we'll, before we go to the geopolitical news, uh, I have some uh, strike news from Kharkiv. Russians have once again attacked Kharkiv. Rescuers on the ground report actually three dead at the moment and five wounded it's there's a lot of fire going on on that top floor of some it's a big building there uh, i doubt it's an industrial enterprise it says i doubt this is really a military target so i don't know whether this is what they were targeting with the akh-59 missile or or, or whether it is uh, air defense jamming making it go awry who knows or just inaccuracy of the missile all of those are fairly plausible. Um, yeah, so pretty uh, substantial fire burning in the building that was hit in Kharkiv. Interestingly, Greg Terry was pretty much on the scene. Uh, and uh, you can go and check out his live stream that, that's uh, giving you some information on that just from across the road. I don't know who's going to be hopping in here. This will be public information, so we're in, we're in Arctic. Just had a massive missile strike. Uh -huh. And he was saying yesterday to me that he was down the road from somewhere else that hit hit uh, another missile that hit, like literally just down the road, as in a missile struck over there. So he's getting a little bit close uh, for my liking, good old Greg. Uh, he needs to be careful out there. He, yeah, so he is there. You can go and check out his his live stream that he put out uh, at the scene of that fire. Um, just see if there's... Yeah, you can see there's fire was still raging right across the top floor of that building when Greg was there. You can see fire in the, in, in the windows. Um, anyway, we'll move on to geopolitical news now. So here Anton Gershchenko is reporting that Hamas congratulated Putin on his victory in the elections. Uh, Hania, head of the Hamas movement's political bureau, sent a congratulatory message to Russian, Russian President Vladimir Putin on the occasion of his re-election as president of the Russian Federation. A message posted on the movement's Telegram channel said, well, you know, that's who your mates are. Well done. Well done, Russia. OK, Russian Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, and the Serbian Dacic, has ministers of foreign affairs, will meet in, tomorrow in Moscow. Serbia have signed, a, I think, a peace agreement with, with Russia. I mean, they have really put their cards on the table, Serbia. Uh, Ivana Stradner has written an article basically saying you're gearing up for war in the area. Wait until some Western di diplomats tell you, don't worry, it's just nationalism for domestic audience. Serbian government actually pro-Western and Vucic is our guy, which is what's been said previously. Well, Vucic isn't their guy and Serbia are really, uh, really aligning themselves with the Russian sphere as of late. And that's a, that's a real challenge for that whole greater region. Indeed, as Jakub Yander here says, this is huge. In 2020, the Slovak Prime Minister, Pellegrini, asked Viktor Orban to arrange for his trip to Moscow to help him win Slovak elections. Uh, Pellegrini is a known tool of the current Russian pro-Russian uh, Prime Minister, Robert Fitso, and he is a leading in the polls in the current presidential race. So at the moment, the president in Slovakia, a woman is um, who, who is a woman, I forget her name, Cap uh, anyway, she is not aligned with Robert Fitzo, the Prime Minister, and she's much more pro-Western, pro-Ukraine, and there's obviously a presidential race on the offing. Uh, well, if, if this Pellegrini chap wins, Russia and its two puppets, Slovak Prime Minister Fitzo and Hungarian Prime Minister Orban, will have a submissive servant as figurehead uh, for the Slovak president, making the Russian elite capture of Slovakia complete. Remember, Slovakia still is a NATO member state hosting a strategically important battle group. Slovak state is already being diplomatically isolated as allies such as Czechia, who do not trust it so they do not share sensitive information with Slovakia as they know it would be handed over to the main enemy in Moscow. This is really significant and you've got to hope that that they aren't able to rig the elections in favour of Pellegrini and that, that, um, that the other options remain viable. Uh, 
a week ago ran in 50,000 people in Budapest. Uh, Hungarian opposition leader Magyar Peter is one is the one to watch now in Hungarian politics. This week doing the rounds on non-regime control media exposing insane levels of corruption. He says, uh, and just to dip into it's him the, him the, talking. Uh, he he says, and this is who we hope will you know, take over from Viktor Orban, if at all possible, at some point tomorrow. I have a hearing at the prosecutor's office. Maybe they will ask about this case. Um, I made references to this in several posts, but it may also be another case I mentioned in my interviews. Um, so it is not certain that tomorrow I can tell the prosecutors the truth um, about this story, after which the government can do nothing but resign. I think what I know and what I can prove is the biggest criminal and political scandal, he says, of the last 34 years after the system change. Wow. So he's really prepping people up for uh, some, some big revelation that he is going to give to the prosecutor's office. Let's see if that has any effect. Um, I, I presume that was from yesterday, so it'll be today... Is that from yesterday? No, actually, that was released today. But they've been protesting quite a bit in Hungary, um, and or at least coming out to support him in rallies and whatnot. Ukraine and Estonia have started negotiations on a bilateral security agreement. Parties have already begun work on a draft agreement and agreed on a schedule for further negotiations. Ukraine is doing that with a lot of nations at the moment, probably using the British one as a blueprint, as was uh, originally understood. Estonia's prime minister... At the same time, has called on the US and NATO allies to be tougher on Russia. Estonia, particularly, Estonia, Lithuania, really, and Latvia is really standing up to Russia. They've got experience of being part of that whole uh, Russian empire in the Soviet Union. Now they are uh, afraid that that history might rear its ugly head and repeat itself. So they are being particularly strong and are calling on US and NATO to follow suit. Well, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg arrived in Armenia yesterday for the first time in his position, which he holds for the 10th year. Stoltenberg held a meeting with Prime Minister Pashinyan, where issues of strengthening Armenian NATO cooperation were discussed. Obviously, this is right on the door, uh, the back door of Russia here. And he also, I think, did he also go to a couple of the other countries around? I think he might have gone to Azerbaijan as well. A quote, we're interested in deepening our cooperation with NATO, and I hope that the individually tailored program for Armenia will be accepted as soon as possible, said P Pashinyan. Uh, I don't know how viable that is, taking on a warring nation in the position it, it is at, but the, certainly the optics here are good for NATO. And as I say, Jens Stoltenberg, I think, visited three countries in a couple of days in around that area and has been a very busy body uh, of late. Now we're going to move on to, of course, the obligatory US segment to this because of, US is the most important country in the world, arguably, for many things, uh, economics and politics and, you know, certain aspects of culture, popular culture, and so on and so forth. And it's super important in terms of military and military aid to Ukraine. So it's the future of NATO really hangs, if not in a balance, but in, in, in the hands of who will be the next US president, arguably. But Trump has just come out yesterday and said that US won't leave NATO. This is what everyone's been worried about. Oh, he's going to leave NATO. The Senate did put some checks and balances in place to, to mean that a president couldn't unilaterally pull the US out of NATO. Former US President Donald Trump said the US will remain in NATO and come to the aid of a bloc member if they are attacked so long as other countries play fair and pay their share of maintaining the alliance. I wonder I wonder if Poland can turn to the US and say, well, you're not playing fair, you're not paying as much as us, so, you know, should we come to your help or et cetera, et cetera, you know. What's the agreement? Well, generally accepted over 2%. On average, all European nations are paying at least 2%. So you know, on average, all the Europeans are. Uh, can you lump all of everyone together? I, can you cherry pick members out of that who, who aren't paying and then just say, well, that's Europe, which is what he's done before, which is a bit of a rotten move because certain members of Europe 
are paying fine, thank you very much, and one member is paying more than the US. So uh, using Europe as this big, broad brush is, is a problem, not that he's doing that exactly here. But anyway, that that's he has flip-flopped, and so, some people are calling him out. But he, here's, here's my opinion, and it's about concentrating on the little things, I think, in life that give you a, an understanding of, of the bigger picture. And the little thing here is that to Trump, this whole war in Ukraine and what's going on with Russia isn't that important. And if he gets pressure from some people and says, like, oh, all right, yeah, we'll always stay in NATO if people pay a fair share. But it's like, I'm not overly bothered. To me, the little things about, about Trump's actions concerning Ukraine and Russia is he doesn't really think it's, it's not really on his radar. And when it is, he's kind of all a bit conspiracy theory or he likes the big man, the Russian, who's a big, strong man. Yeah, I kind of like what he's like. I like people that, that sit up straight when, they're, when their president speaks to them. A bit like King John and that hot mic we heard when he's pe speaking to Fox's Ducey the other day, uh, talking about how, you know, how he kind of respected King John Un for, for that. That's what he likes. But it's the war isn't that important. Whereas to people like you and I, you and me, it it is massively important. It is so freaking important that it's scaring the bejesus out of us that that things aren't aren't working out as they should, and there's an impasse in Congress. So it and on that note, let's listen to Nikki Haley, who as UN envoy under Trump was in the same room as Putin and Trump. And this is exactly the kind of, of information we heard from Malcolm Turnbull, the former Australian prime minister, who said very similar. He was completely wrong because every time he was in the same room with him, he got weak in the knees. We can't have a president that gets weak in the knees with Putin. We have to have a president that's going to be strong with Putin in every sense of the word. He was... <laughs> This is what Malcolm Turnbull said. He said it was so creepy that that there was this kind of acquiescence to Putin, this this hero worship of a dictator, that that you could almost tangibly feel it in the, in the room, and and all the leaders felt that way. Said Malcolm Turnbull. Well, Nikki Haley, who was working for Trump at the time, is saying pretty much the same. Now, I reported yesterday about how Paul Manafort is is. You know, Trump's trying to bring Paul Manafort back into the loop and help him with the campaign. And I talked about how absolutely horrendous that was and dangerous for national security. Timothy Snyder, who is a historian of Ukraine and an expert on, on all matters Ukrainian, says Manafort doesn't stand out among Trump's advisors as a convicted, convicted criminal, which he is. He's a massively convicted criminal, although he was pardoned by Trump. He says so many are, but he does stand out for his experience working directly for the Kremlin, managing clients of the Kremlin and getting into debt to a Russian oligarch and trying to pay it back in political favours. Just absolute uh, shocker. Um, yeah, just to remind you here, Manafort Trump's in imprisoned campaign manager used for Boda's anti-Semitism to neutralise support for Rapunzel Tomashenko, whom Yanukovych had imprisoned in a dark tower. So um, Paul Manafort campaign lobbied for Yanukovych, a pro-Russian leader, for being brought onto the uh, to the Trump campaign. Deripaska, who's a Russian oligarch or Ukrainian-Russian oligarch, pro-Russian oligarch, paid for Trump's jailed campaign manager Paul Manafort's work in Ukraine, including Manafort's campaign to justify Timoshenko's imprisonment. Manafort promoted argument that because Timoshenko had been in coalition with anti-Semitic Svoboda, she des deserved jail. Russia funded Svoboda. Um, yeah, and then it goes on, you know, three times Trump extorts Ukraine. Uh, so there's so much. I don't want to go down rabbit holes here. But anyway, yeah, so I, I think associating with Paul Manafort is such an issue. Now, this is an interesting one. So Joe Manchin here, I, many of you won't know American politics unless you are American or interested. Um, so he's a Democratic senator, but he lives in a, a he's, his state is an oil rich state where he is basically a Republican Democrat. 
is being highly controversial and siding with key issues with the Republicans. And when you've got a, a, a razor thin majority as at present or previously like 50 50 in the Senate, like people like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema have been as Democrats who have veered to the Republican side have been incredibly controversial. But, you know, he's, he's actually, um, not going to be running in 2024, and I think his state is highly likely to go Republican. But the failure for the US to pass continued aid to Ukraine could cause the worst atrocity in history, says Democratic Senator Joe Manchin during a summit hosted by Axios. I think that's really good, and it is good that he is in the position he's in and the kind of influence he has amongst a certain type of people. It's great to hear Joe Manchin. I'm not a fan of Joe Manchin. But it's great to hear him say that. Polish uh, Foreign Minister Radoslav Sikorski says approving Ukraine aid is a matter of US credibility. Quote, we wouldn't be on the back foot if the American supplemental came through. And I again appeal to Speaker Johnson to let it go to the vote and let democracy take its course. This is incredibly important, but, you know, it's pissing in the wind, isn't it, really? Uh, unfortunately. Now. Time for you to get a little bit more angry, perhaps. So these are the US House of Representative members that no longer care if anyone knows they are owned by Russia. The FBI needs to be all over them, says Jane Kiev. OK, so what's happened? So the House has just voted to condemn Putin's kidnapping of children. This should be the easiest. For I've read the bill myself. Like, this is easy vote. It's like, yeah, well, that's obvious. Vote that unless I'm, unless I'm being paid by Russia or I'm a moral reprobate. So the only two options for being part of this crew of nine. Nine Republicans voted against the resolution. Chip Roy, who's said some interesting things recently, Chip Roy, criticising his own Republican uh, caucus, the, the Republican House members for not voting for the immigration bill. I think he was actually really... Uh, critical of Republicans for not voting that through. Yet he's come out in not being against Putin's kidnapping of children, Ukrainian children. Andy Biggs, Tom Tiffany, Clay Higgins, Eric Burleson, Thomas Massey, Matt Rosendale, Warren Davison, and, oh, who knew? Marjorie Taylor Greene. If there's one human being I detest more than Marjorie Taylor Greene, it's probably Putin, actually. I don't know. Her or Trump? That's an interesting one for me. Anyway, like this, goodness me, I think, is it, the bill is, oh, I don't know where, there is, uh, the bill is somewhere in a reply on somewhere on this thread. The actual uh, words of the bill, which I think is worth worth reading. It's a quick read and it's um, a really, con really uncontroversial bill that nine people appear not to have... Um, not to have signed and you're just wondering what the heck are you doing like uh, anyway that's that they nine of them haven't voted if you want to let your distaste for them be known uh, i'm not going to stop you as tim white said in the u.s a resolution was passed condemning the illegal abduction of children from ukraine to the russian federation how could anyone object to this resolution rhetorical question we all know why and so do voters surely uh, but of course you know they that not all of them care so much both lawmakers and voters alike uh, unfortunately with those particular people con uh, concerned right moving away from american politics now you'll be happy to know uh so this is new york britain's motoring lobby group so the these are people who who are arguing on behalf of the motoring industry in in the uk has insisted that the unprecedented 2000 percent increase in car exports to Azerbaijan has nothing to do with Russia and it is explained by the fact that this former Soviet state ha is a flourishing market in its own right. It's a bit odd that Azerbaijan would suddenly have a 2000% increase from 2021 to now. Nothing to do with the war, just, just, just so happens that they love a good car. Ah, uh, just so frustrating i mean there's lots of detail on this it's the usual kind of stuff about getting around the loopholes um 
the TLDR is UK car exports to Russia have collapsed because of sanctions, but UK car exports to countries neighbouring Russia have suddenly risen by nearly the same amount, especially Azerbaijan. But, says the car lobbying group, it, it's just a flourishing market, right? There's just suddenly a bunch of Azerbaijanis with a bunch of money who are wanting to buy British cars. And it appears that it's about the same amount as there were Russians who wanted to buy British cars before, but can't now. Hmm. He thinks there's a little bit of coincidence there. EU renews suspension on import duties and quotas on Ukrainian agricultural exports. Uh, that's a suspension on import duties, which means that they are treating agricultural imports like um, like European ones. And, and this is what's causing the tension... I think it's been extended until June, causing tension in places or partly what's causing tension with farmers in places like Poland. But at the same time, Poland and even France are putting up sort of bilateral uh, agreements or, or I don't know if they can. They're, they're poss possibly just arguing with the EU to get to get Ukraine um, tariffs or the lack of tariffs changed Um as I discussed yesterday, at the same time, the EU is seeking to put tariffs on Russian and Belarusian agricultural imports, uh, which could soften the blow if they did end up uh, starting to make things more difficult for the Ukrainians, because the Ukrainians would still have a competitive advantage over the Russians because Ukrainians would operate at a normal non-EU level and the Russians would be given a further 95 euros per tonne, I believe. And that means that the Ukrainian agricultural product, if it's the same, would be um, more attractive to than the Russians. Um, anyway, Ukraine will lose 6.5 billion hryvnias in customs revenue in March due to the Polish blockade. At the same time, the largest protest action of Poles is taking place with 580 protests across the country. The border with Ukraine is also blocked. And this is just the ongoing uh, disaster that is the, the continued Polish blockade that seems to have caught on a little bit in other places as well. Now... That's the end of the news concerning Ukraine. I am going to end with this, though, because I know that I have some Finnish um, viewers. And as Pekka Kalyaniemi says, Finland ranked the world's happiest country for the seventh year. Me celebrating an absolutely ecstatic state. Of course, that's a Finns for you. They're happy on the inside. Happy on the inside. Uh, I have reported on the happiness... Uh, rankings before in the World Happiness Report. It's fascinating reading, actually. And the way that they calculate it all is so much more involved into how you or how the report evaluates happiness to do with, you know, welfare and trust in, in civic institutions, all sorts of different components that then lead to an overall sense of kind of satisfaction, well-being, happiness, as well as, you know, how much you smile and that, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, really worth reading if, if you get a time to do that. I haven't looked at this year's, but it, it's, it's great to see Finland there again uh, for the seventh year in a row. Let me know, my Finnish friends, whether you are happy or whether the seasonal adjusted depression of not having much sunlight means that you're drowning your sorrows in some Finnish vodka on a nightly basis. Now, on to my own welfare, uh, just to let you know, as many of you know, I had primary progressive multiple sclerosis, and I had like the most important day of the year was today. I had an MRI scan, scan what is it, six weeks ago, something like that, and today I was going to the neurologist, I presume, to get the results of that scan, uh, the evaluation and his expert opinion, so... We had a meeting. He was like, how are you feeling? I gave him where I think I'm doing well. I think my walking's a bit getting worse and the feeling in my fingers is worse. But it's partly because I don't do any exercise and sit on my fat ass all day doing this. Um, and so there's all that. And I said, so at one point, I was like, so is have you got any information on my MRI? It's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think. When did you have that? I was like, 
six weeks ago. It's like, oh, it looks, oh yeah, no, I've just written a new letter for that. Yeah, it's all fine, no problem. I was like, oh, okay, right, that's the main reason I thought I was here. Turns out my MRI is fine. Uh, no change, which is amazing, which means there's no progress, at least in that component. It's, MS is far more complicated than that, and stuff happens below whether you get scarification in your and lesions in your brain. Multiple sclerosis means multiple scars multiple lesions and that's you have an MRI scan and you see these scars and into your spinal cord and whatnot. Now as my body attacks my own central nervous system so think of my central nervous system or yours as a wire that sends messages you have wires sending messages all around your body and with a wire you cover it in a plastic sheath which pr protects it the insulation that protects a wire right well the, the human body has a myelin sheath which is this protective sheath around your central nervous system that's what your immune system attacks. And because all your messaging is done by your central nervous system, if that protection gets destroyed, then it means that the, the nerves themselves wear away and stop working. And so eventually, nothing, no messages get anywhere. So at the moment, the messages to my legs are very poor. Can't feel my fingers. I have an overactive bladder. And so all these things, just the messages getting messed up. And my balance is dodgy. Uh, you know, fatigue, although my fatigue's been all right recently, and um, you know, cognitive load issues, not being able to find words, multitasking, stuff cognitively, stuff physically, etc., etc. And eventually, I will just keep shutting down more and more and more until I die, right? And the idea is that you got to do something about that. But when I was diagnosed, there was nothing for progressive multiple sclerosis where you just get worse, only stuff for regressing, remitting, where you go up and down, up and down, up and down. And then eventually, you get to the stage where you just get worse. So I went and had stem cell therapy in Moscow in 2019 because uh, it was the best place in the world for it and it was an amazing experience and it plateaued my MS from, instead of just getting worse, it plateaued it where I was. I actually got a little bit better and now I've returned to about where I was when I when I went to have the treatment. And, and that was amazing. I'll never be able to go back to Russia now with the amount of uh, stuff I've been saying about Russia. Anyway, so that's 2019 and it's been plateaued. And so when I go and get an MRI and say, how's it going now? I'm always obviously nervous about like, please brain be in the same state it was last year. And it is, and that's fantastic. And it's so much so that he's like, we're going to next scan you in two years time. And I'm effectively discharging you, but not discharging you. We just change the way we do things. And then two, two years time, we'll have a chat and then that'll move to three years unless anything goes wrong. And so that's really good news. So I, I've had about as good news as I possibly could today. I just need to do more exercise. Uh, and you guys aren't helping there. It's not you, it's 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 this, it's you know my massive obsession with this war and just spend all my time, if I'm not at the computer, I'm on my phone anywhere in the house or anywhere that I'm doing stuff, I'm like looking into what's going on in the war. So I need to get on the treadmill. I was given a treadmill by my parents-in-law a couple of years ago for a Christmas present with the boys, uh, probably about four years ago now. And it's in the garage just there. I just, some psychological barrier that, that, that I don't get on enough. I need to overcome that because, you know, your health. It's all about your health. Anyway, that's my health update. I won't bore you again with it. I just thought I'd package it all up into one nugget here at the end of this. Not that many of you care, but can I just say thank you very much for the very kind words for those who who um, who decided that they did care enough to, to write me some nice messages. So thank you for that. Um, and we'll get back to talking uh, about the map now. I've got to do my mapping update, thanks to JR, who's done the mapping. In the meantime, take care, speak soon.